Okay? And we stopped here in last class. So we start from here. Uh, the follicular growth, maturation, and ovulation, rupture of the follicle, those are controlled by a number of hormones. So the growth of the follicles, the maturation of the follicles, and the rupture of the follicles, those are controlled by hormones. We will see how the hormones control those things. Okay? So you know that pituitary gland releases a number of hormones. Among those hormones, anterior pituitary hormones, luteinizing hormone, and follicle stimulating hormone. Those two hormones work on the follicles. Follicles are present in the cortex of the ovary. You have seen in last class, right? So those two hormones work on the follicles in the cortex of the ovary and stimulate the follicles to release two hormones, inhibiting and estrogen. Those two hormones are released by the follicles and so follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, those are released from the anterior pituitary and work on the follicles and tell the follicles to release inhibiting and estrogen. Okay? And those two hormones can negatively work on the pituitary gland can inhibit the pituitary gland to release the follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. They can also inhibit the hypothalamus to stimulate the, uh, not to stimulate the pituitary gland. Anyway, so the estrogen works on the follicles to and help in the maturation of the follicles. So you see here, uh, the estrogen will work on the follicle and help in the maturation of the follicle. And mature, the most mature follicle is the graphene follicle, right? You know that graphene follicle. And when the follicle becomes graphene follicle, that graphene follicle can produce large amount of estrogen. So graphene follicle, the most mature follicle, can produce plenty of estrogen. Okay? And that estrogen will stimulate the pituitary gland. This is positive feedback, not negative, okay? Will stimulate the pituitary, anterior pituitary to release the luteinizing hormone or LH suddenly. Plenty of LT, LH, luteinizing hormone will be released suddenly and that is called luteinizing hormone surge. Sudden and large amount of release of luteinizing hormone. That is the luteinizing hormone surge. And that luteinizing hormone surge is very important to cause the rupture of the graphene fault. Okay? So, sudden release of large amount of luteinizing hormone will cause what? Cause the rupture of the graphene fault. And that is the ovulation. Okay, so that is the ovulation. And when the ovulation will occur, the egg will get out, will be released, and the remaining part of the follicle will be converted to corpus luteum. We have seen that in last class, right? The remaining part of the graphene follicle will be converted to corpus luteum and corpus luteum will work as a temporary gland and I have mentioned in last class it will produce three hormones right estrogen, progesterone and inhibitor. Okay. <clears throat> now corpus luteum will produce those three hormones and those three hormones 
will inhibit the pituitary and the hypothalamus. So those three hormones will do what? Inhibit the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. So pituitary gland will do what? It will not release follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Make sense? Okay. Now, why that is important? Why the corpus lutea should tell the pituitary gland not to release follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone? Because when the follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, those hormones are released, then follicles grow, right? And becomes natural follicle. But we don't want another follicle to rupture immediately after one ovulation. Immediately after one ovulation, we don't want, within few days, we don't want another ovulation, right? So, how long the corpus luteum will stay inside the ovary? Normally, if fertilization doesn't occur, 14 days, right? And we we'll keep inhibiting the hypothalamus and pituitary not to cause rupture of another follicle, not to mature another follicle. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's why we don't see another ovulation in those 14 days, right? Then the corpus luteum will be what? Yes. Destroyed, yes. right? Will be destroyed. If fertilization doesn't occur, corpus luteum will be destroyed. Then what will happen? That inhibition will be gone, right? Because corpus luteum is not there, these hormones are not there, so this inhibition is gone. So what the pituitary will do? Again, release that follicular stimulating and luteinizing. So another egg will get mature. <coughs> Make sense? So that's why the presence of corpus luteum is important, not to let another egg get mature and rupture. Make sense? Now, if fertilization takes place, how long the corpus luteum will be there? Three to four months, that I said in the last class. Right? Why that is important? Do you want ovulation during pregnancy, we don't want, we don't see that, right? That should not happen. So the corpus luteum is there to keep inhibiting the hypothalamus and pituitary, okay? For the first three to four months, not to let another egg get matured and rupture. And that happens, right? But now we can ask, then what happens after three to four months? After three to four months, the placenta will already be developed there, and it will produce the same hormones and tell the pituitary and hypothalamus, and no ovulation will occur until the end of the pregnancy, right? So that's how the hormonal control takes place, okay? Okay, so in the female body, uh, two cycles uh, takes place uh, in the reproductive system, the ovarian cycle and the menstrual cycle. We have talked about the ovarian cycle in last class, uh, I have also talked a little bit about the menstrual cycle, but we will just repeat again. So, menstrual cycle is also called the uterine cycle because it happens inside the uterus. Okay. So, the menstrual cycle is a repeating series of changes in the endometria. Endometrium has two layers, right? Functional layer and basal layer. You remember that I showed you in last class. And functional layer is destroyed and produced again, and destroyed and produced again. Okay, so that happens in the changes occur in the functional layer: destruction and reproduction, and destruction and production again. The formation of the functional layer occurs. Okay, now uh, the duration of the menstrual cycle, uh, it's not fixed, it varies person to person, time to time, uh, it depends on age too. So it lasts from 21 to 35 days, but average is 28 days. So it's the same length of the ovarian cycle, right? The ovarian cycle is also 28 days. Okay, now uh, the menstrual cycle has three phases. Menstruation, or menstrual phase, polyphagic phase, and secretory phase. Okay, so we'll see 
in last class I sh uh, showed you on the whiteboard those three tables, but don't talk to me. So you see here, this is a nice picture, I like this. Uh, so this is one phase, this is another, and this is the last phase. So first phase is the menstruation, destruction of the functional layer of the endometrium. So you see, at the beginning, the functional layer is very thick, and then during this phase, what happens? The destruction of the functional layer occurs. And when the destruction occurs, this functional layer almost disappears. Okay? Almost completely destroyed. Okay. Uh, and when the functional layer is destroyed, what are the things will get out from the body? You see here, in the functional layer, you have epithelial tissue, blood vessels, right? These are glands. See this, this structure, these are glands. So, uh, in the menstrual blood, you will find epithelial tissue, dead epithelial tissue, destroyed blood vessels, destroyed glands, right? Make sense? And blood. When blood vessels will be destroyed, some blood will come out, right? So, you will find blood, dead epithelial tissue, you will find destroyed glands and destroyed blood vessels. Those are the components of uh, the menstruation. Shedding of the functional layer of the endometrium. Then, after that destruction, next what happens, again, the functional layer is formed. That phase is called proliferative phase. Makes sense, right? Proliferation means increased uh, production. So, that layer will be formed again. And the period when that layer, functional layer, will be re-established or reformed again, that phase is called the proliferative phase. So, you see what happens in proliferative phase? New blood vessels will be formed, new glands will be formed in that layer. Okay? And that they will get thicker. And last phase is the secretory phase. These glands will start to secrete fluid. Okay? These glands will start to secrete a lot of fluid. So when the glands will secrete a lot of fluid in that layer, what will happen? That layer will be uh, will become very soft. Soft, right? Soft. Uh, it's it's uh, the bed, the endo, uh, you know, uterus is preparing for the friend to come and sleep there. You remember I said uh, before? So the uterus will make that bed and make it very soft and nice, comfortable, okay? For the fertilized egg to come and stick there. Okay, so now we'll see the duration of those three phases, okay? So, menstruation or menstrual phase lasts for seven days. And proliferative phase is another seven days. And secretory phase is the longer phase, 14 days. So, total 28 days. 28 days, right? So, 14 days, uh, sorry, seven days, seven days, and 14 days. Okay? Now, uh, if you see the top, top part of this picture, um, changes of estrogen and progesterone during the menstrual cycle. Very important. Uh, just focus on estrogen and progesterone, the blue and red lines. Okay? Don't need to uh, look the dark one. Oh, sorry. The, the red and the Dark one, okay? Estrogen and progesterone. So, yeah. So, if I ask you, see here, during the proliferative phase, just look here, the level of estrogen is much higher than the level of progesterone. Make sense? The level of estrogen is much higher than the level of progesterone during the proliferative phase, okay? 
Now you see the secretory phase. If you see the secretory phase, the level of progesterone is much higher than the level of estrogen. Okay, so opposite. Now we can tell by looking this graph that if I ask you now tell me what's the function of estrogen. Estrogen will help in the proliferation or growth of the functional layer, the formation of the fun functional layer. Makes sense? So estrogen level is higher. Why? It will help the formation, formation of the functional layer. Makes sense? Mm -hmm. Very simple. Now, if I ask you, what's the function of progesterone? Progesterone is higher during the secretory phase, right? So it helps in making the bed. Yeah, maintaining the bed, maintaining the bed. Okay. So now uh, I'm repeating again. Estrogen helps in the proliferation or formation of the functional layer, and progesterone helps in maintaining, keep it soft and nice, right? Maintaining the functional layer. Now. If the progesterone concentration drops, if the level of progesterone goes suddenly down, what will happen? The bed will remain there or will be destroyed? To be destroyed. Because first the function of progesterone, I said, it maintains the bed, right? So at the end of the secretory phase, what happens? The concentration or level of progesterone suddenly drops and that destroys the the functional layer. functional layer of the endometrium. Okay, that is again menstruation or menstrual phase will occur. So after this, you have this phase again, the destruction, and then proliferation, and then secretory. Then again, destruction. Okay. So the level of hormones, estrogen, progesterone, are changing. Okay, continuously. Now you see the bottom part of this picture. The change of basal body temperature. You know that probably during menstrual cycle, the body temperature changes. And the body temperature slightly increases during the secretory phase of menstruation. Just know that, okay? So you see here the red line. The body temperature slightly increases about 0.3 degrees Celsius uh, during the so this picture is a nice picture. I like this. Okay. So how much uh, blood is released uh, in menstruation? Thirty-five to fifty milliliter. And anything important here? Okay, so uh, let's fall from this part. Now we'll talk about uh, fertilization. Female gonads are ovaries, and gonads testes and female gonads ovaries. Okay. Now, gonads produce what? Sex hormones. And gametes. Okay. So both. Testes and ovaries produce gametes. Gametes are sex cells. And gametes, uh, male gamete and female, right? Female. Okay. Now, uh, 
how many chromosomes the gametes have? 23, 23 right? Haploid number. So, male gamete sperm, right? Male gamete is the sperm, has 23 chromosomes, and female gamete is the ovum, right? Or egg or oocyte has 23 chromosomes. And when fertilization occurs, what is fertilization? A fusion of sperm and the ovum, right? Sperm and ovum, they get together. And when fertilization occurs, the chromosomes, 23 chromosomes from the sperm, get mixed with 23 chromosomes of the egg. So how many chromosomes you get? 46 in fertilized egg. So this is the fertilized egg. And that's the first cell of the body, okay, fertilized egg. And all our body cells contain 46 chromosomes, except the sex cells, right? So all other body cells have 46 chromosomes. So this is the first cell of the body. So when this cell will produce all other body cells, the chromosomes should remain same, 46, right? So what type of cell division should occur? Mitosis. Mitosis, because we know that mitosis keeps the chromosome number same. Meiosis will reduce to half, right? So uh, from the fertilized egg, all body cells are formed by mitosis, okay? Now, the fertilized egg, is called zygote. So, zygote is the fertilized egg which has 46 chromosomes. Okay? So, gametes are sex cells, sperm, and ovum, right? And gonads are the primary sex organs, and zygote is the fertilized egg, okay? which has 46 chromosomes. Okay, fertilization occurs inside the uterine tube. In most of the cases, cases, fertilization takes place inside the uterine tube. And particularly, in which part of the uterine tube? Ampula. The ampulla of the uterine tube. Okay. Uh, this picture, this is a real picture. You see uh, the egg, only one egg, and on the surface, on the surface of the egg, many sperm are attached, right, to the surface of the egg. And thousands of the sperm will get attached to the outer surface of the egg, and egg is very big compared to the size of the sperm, much, much bigger. And many sperm can get attached to the outer surface of the egg. Only one egg is produced, right? Right. Uh, uh, by ovulation and released by ovulation and those sperm will start to dig and go inside okay will start to take the wall of the egg and will start to go inside all of them then for one when one sperm will reach inside then other sperms will stop moving further okay and eventually they will die so it's like, you know, I told you probably uh, race. When many people start to race, only one good prize. Then uh, you, if you see that someone has already reached there, then you will not run. No, no point of running anymore, right? So it will stop there. So it's formed to like that. Only one is needed to fertilize, right? So when that one will reach there, then others will stop going inside. This is a, you know, amazing uh, you know, system. I mean, you just think that if two or more sperm go inside, then what will happen? The chromosome number will be triple or four times or five times more, right? That's not uh, good. So, uh, that happens. Now, you know that when I talk about the shape of the sperm, uh, on the head of the sperm, you have what? A cap. That is called acrosome or acrosomal cap, and that contains what? Digestive enzymes. Digestive enzymes. And uh, when the head of the sperm will 
get attached to the surface of the egg, then from the acrosomal cap, the digestive enzymes will start to get released, and that will destroy the worm. Okay, so it will go in. in Uh, the name of those digestive enzymes, hyaluronidase and acrosin. Just uh, those are the digestive uh, fluid or enzymes in the acrosomal cap, and they will destroy the wall of the egg or oocyte. Okay. <coughs> Capacitation. Uh, a sperm is not completely 100% effective until or unless it enters into the female body. Although it is mature, but it is not completely effective. Effective means what? Effective to uh, fertilize the egg. Okay? It's not capable to fertilize the egg until it passes through the female body. So, uh, did you get it? So, for a sperm to get 100% effective, it must enter into the female body. And that process is called capacitation. How a sperm becomes fully effective, 100% effective to do what? To fertilize the egg. Make sense? So that is the capacitation. So part of capaci capacitation takes place inside the male body and the completion of capacitation takes place in the female body. Here you see that uh, only one sperm will enter into the egg and then the chromosomes. You know that uh, in sperm, chromosomes are located in the head part, right? That is where the nucleus goes, uh, genetic center. Uh, so the chromosomes of the head of the sperm will be released here and the chromosomes of the nucleus of the egg will be released and they will then uh, mix together and form 46 uh, chromosomes. Okay, then after the zygote, after the zygote is formed, that's the fertilized egg, then multiplication will start and that multiplication or will occur by mitosis and first few cell divisions are called cleavers. So cleavers indicates first few cell divisions. After the zygote is formed, then the zygote will start to divide or multiply by mitosis and only first few cell divisions are called cleavers. Okay? So we'll see what happens. You see that this is the fallopian tube and this is the ampulla of the fallopian tube where this sperm will arrive and will uh, fertilize the egg. Okay? And then fertilized egg or zygote will start to move towards the uterus. I told you that you will meet your friend right at the airport and then you will bring you together will come to your house. So fertilized egg will start to move towards the house. House is the uterus. And when the zygote will start to move, cleavage or cell division will occur. Okay? So you see cell is dividing by mitosis. And so uh, first the cell will divide into two, then it will become four. And those stages are called blastomeres. So blastomeres are just two cell or four cell stages. Then the multiplication will continue and a 
solid ball of cells will be formed. About 30, 30 to 32 cells will form a solid, what? Solid ball. Okay? That solid ball of 30 to 32 cells, that stage is called morula. So morula is a solid ball of cells. And that contains about 30 cells. Then, next, what will happen? Inside that solid ball or morula, a cavity will be formed. So it is no more a solid ball, a cavity will be formed. And that stage is called blastocyst. So blastocyst is the stage in which you will see a cavity inside the cellular structure. Okay, now uh, I'll draw a blastocyst here. And if you see inside the blastocyst, you will see a mass of cells. This is the mass of cells that is called inner cell mass. So you will see, if you cut the blastocyst, you will see that in uh, one location, uh, many cells are clustered together and that is called inner cell mass, okay, these cells, this structure. And the cells that will form the surface of the ball, those cells are called tropoblasts, tropoblasts. The tropoblasts are these cells that will form the surface of the ball. And if you cut it, you'll see uh, in one location, many cells are together uh, and they form a mass that is the inner cell mass. Okay. Now, next, this is the blastocyst. Next, what will happen? Uh, the inner cell mass will produce three layers of cells. Okay, one layer. Three layers will be formed. Okay, we can say this is one layer, this is another layer, and this is another layer. So three layers of cells will be formed. The outermost one is called ectoderm. Ectoderm and middle one is called mesoderm and innermost one layer is called endoderm. Okay, endo means inside, you know that. Uh, so ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Those layers are called. Germ layers. Okay, germ layers. And our body organs come from, or structures come from those three layers. Okay, some structures originate from ectoderm, like your brain, okay, nervous system. Some structures originate from mesoderm, like your heart and blood vessels, uh, muscles, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle. Some structures originate from endoderm. Okay? Uh, so just know that uh, all our body parts originate from those three layers. And that's why those are called germ layers. That will be formed by inner cell mass. In our okay. <coughs> See, big form. Uh, what? What your organs? 
they come from inner selmas, those three layers. <coughs> all body parts or stuff. So those are the first structures. And from those three layers, other structures will be formed. Now, uh, another thing you need to know from here, if uh, we consider fertilization is day zero, then after fertilization, what happens? The fertilized egg starts to move towards the uterus. And it takes about six days for the structure to arrive in the uterus. And then when the structure arrives in the uterus, the fertilized egg, that is already in blastocyst state. You see the cavity inside, okay? So that is already in blastocyst state. And then the blastocyst will do what? Will get stick to the endometrium, will get attached to the endometrium because endometrium has made very nice bed for the blastocyst, right? Already the soft bed is there. So the blastocyst will get stick to the functional layer of the endometrium and that process is called implantation. Okay, so implantation is the process by which uh, or implantation is uh, just the attachment of the blastocyst to the endometrium, all of the endometrium. Okay. Uh, now, uh, you see, after ovulation, uh, the released egg will be taken inside the fallopian tube or uterine tube. By what? By the fimbria, right? So, and there is a gap between the surface of the ovary and fimbria like this. They are not like exactly at us. There is a space, okay? There. So, there is a chance that fimbria may not get the egg, may not be able to capture the egg, okay? So, in that case, what will happen? The egg will enter into the peritoneal cavity. Anywhere it can go, right? Uh, it can get attached to the surface of the ovary, and then the sperm will travel this way, will get out, and if the sperm can fertilize the egg here, okay, or also we use uh, the term ectopic pregnancy, probably you have heard ectopic pregnancy, uh, inside the peritoneal cavity, anywhere it can happen, false pregnancy. It will not produce, why you say false, it will not produce any embryo. First few cell division will occur because the egg has nutrients, right? Huge amount of nutrients. So first few cell divisions will occur, but then eventually it will die. Because the endometria has a lot of nutrients. The endometrial, uh, the endometrium, the wall of the liter. But that nutrients are not present in other form. Okay? So uh, the <coughs> blastocyst will not get enough nutrition and it does. So anyway, so that is the ectopic pregnancy. Uh, we also use the term ectopic pregnancy if fertilization, we know that fertilization takes place here, but if the fertilized egg can move and go inside the uterus. If the fertilized egg is not implanted, then it will not get nutrition because a lot of nutrition is present in the functional layer of the endometrium. Okay? So it will die. And uh, that could be very problematic because sometimes that uh, dead tissue can stick anywhere and can cause cancer or formation of tumor. Okay? So it is better if you uh, see the ectopic pregnancy, remove that tissue okay, from the body. If it stays there, it can produce or create problems. Okay? <coughs> So in the test, if I ask you, then tell me, uh, four cell stays, what is that? That is blastocyst, right? 
if I ask you 30 cells, 30 cells stays, what is that? Marula, the ball, solid ball of 30 cells, if I ask you, that is what? Marula, right? Uh, if I ask you a ball that has a cavity inside, that is what? Blastocyst. Blastocyst, right? Uh, how many days it will take uh, the fertilizer to reach to the return cavity, okay? Six. Um, and then after that, implantation will occur, right? And implantation usually occurs in days 7 to 10. If you count from 0, uh, day 7 to 10. 10, uh, during that time, implantation occurs. Okay. Uh, so those are the things you need to know from here. Professor? Yes. How many cells does the blastocyst have again? Blastocyst, the count is not fixed because inner cell mass has many cells. We don't okay. count that, okay? So uh, many cells. Okay, and the placenta will be formed, and placenta is a complex organ that permits the exchange between maternal and embryonic circulatory system, uh, and supports the fetus uh, in second and third trimester, because first trimester is supported by the corpus luteum, right, the hormones, uh, the fetus doesn't need uh, direct blood from mother's body. And the placenta gets out from the mother's body uh, just after the birth. Now, uh, you know twins, two types of twins uh, can um, be formed. One is called monozygotic, another is dizygotic. Now you will understand uh, the fertilized egg is the zygote. So if this is the fertilized egg, uh, what can happen? Uh, two eggs can be produced and fertilized by two sperm. And that is dizygotic because two zygotes will be formed, right? Two separate zygotes will be formed. And this is one this will form one embryo, this will form another embryo. So that is dizygotic. Now Another thing can happen, uh, only one zygote will be formed, but when the cell division will occur, two separate embryos will be formed by cell division. Usually one should be formed, but if two separate embryos are formed, then this one will form one baby, this one will form another baby. So from the same zygote or cell. So this is monozygotic twin. Okay? So which one is genetically identical? Monozygotic. Because coming from same cell, same chromosomes, right? Uh, so that's the identical twin. Okay. okay. So we have talked about capacitation. Okay, so we are good. Do you have any questions? No questions? So this is blastocyst, right? This is? Blastocyst, and this will get attached to what? Uterine wall. Uterine wall, endometrium of the uterus, right? Then that is the implantation, right? After implantation, what will happen? These are trophoblasts, right? These cells are trophoblasts. They will multiply. It's like you when you put seed in the soil. First, you make nice bed, right? Put water, and then it's soft and then you put the seed, and then what happens? The root comes out, right? And invades in, in the deeper part of the soil. So same thing will happen. After implantation, then these 
tropoblasts, those are attached to the endometrium, they will multiply. They will multiply. Probably you don't need to remember this for your test, just uh, uh, see what happened. These cells, tropoblast, will multiply. Okay? And then, what will happen? Some tropoblasts, they will fuse together. The walls will be removed and they will fuse together and will form like this. That is called syncytial tropoblast. Why it is called syncytial? You know syncytial? Have you heard the word syncytium? When we talk about the heart muscle, we said that heart muscle works as a functional syncytium, right? That means as a unit, single unit, or single cell. Here, you see same thing, many cells will join together and will form one unit. That's why this is called syncytial tropoblast. Fusion of many tropoblasts and will form one cell-like structure. And, uh, these are called cellular cellular tropoblast because they will remain as individual cells. So also some here. These are cellular tropoblast. Syncytial tropoblast, cellular tropoblast. Now next what will happen? Uh, they will invade further and will form Structures like this. These are called villi. Chorionic villi. And what villi? Chori chorionic villi. Villi means you know that finger like hair is like a yeah, going yeah. inwards, going inside the wall of the uterus. And uh, uterus is a part of mother's body, right? So, the mother's blood will flow here, in between the villi, in between the villi, and new blood vessels will be formed from fetus body embryo here, new blood vessels. So you see here, uh, from mother's blood, from mother's blood, oxygen and nutrients will enter into the fetus blood vessels here, okay. So that is one thing, and the chorionic villi, will start to release human chorionic gonadotropin HCG and that is tested you know to see if pregnancy oh, is yeah. positive or negative right so the chorionic villi will release that hormone now if you see that hormone in the blood that means the implantation has been taken place right so the villi has been form uh, that can make sure that, you know, for the, the pregnancy has, has occurred. Okay, uh, so that's what happens, okay. Also, we can take these cells, tropoblasts, from here. We can collect, right, tropoblasts from here and test the genes inside the tropoblast and to test if uh, any, any defect is present in the uh, embryo, right? We can test that. Uh, so we can easy, uh, you know, destruction of tropoblastic cells will not bother, will not harm, will not cause any harm, right? So we can collect few tropoblast cells from there and can examine the genes and Down syndrome or, you know, uh, other... Uh, the amniocentesis? Yes. So uh, also... Uh, these cells, uh, not only, uh, you know, cells are here, some cells uh, in, are uh, present in the amniotic fluid. Yes. Those cells are very loose cells, okay? So, if you take the amni amniotic fluid, you will find some tropoblast cells there. They float in the amniotic fluid, so you can also take the cells from there. So, the tropoblasts are eventually going to be placenta? Yes, they will eventually form the placenta. What, what, um what cells 
make you don't go for it. Is it trouble blasts as well? I might go for I think so. Uh, so it's a part of the placenta, we say. It, it, it gets attached to the placenta. Uh, so uh, here are the two important things. One is the inner cell mass forms the embryo, okay? Three layers, young layer. And the tropoblast cells form the placenta that you say. Okay, so you are good.